Welcome to the Daily Sports Network. Enjoy the show. Welcome back. Welcome back. We're here today for the first episode of The Coach's Corner um, with my buddy Joe. Joe, how's it going? Going very well. I'm glad to be in the corner. You'd prefer that over the hot seat. I'm glad I had that. Hopefully I'm not on that segment anytime soon. Yeah. So um, tell me about yourself a little bit. Tell me about your position. Tell me about how you got there. Talk about that a little bit. Not a problem, man. Um, coaching's a funny world, man. It's very competitive. It's hard to get into. It's kind of like a, um, a tight-knit community. I'd be lying if I told you, you know, I dreamed of being a coach when I was growing up. I was kind of a confused kid like most other people. I had no idea I wanted to be a coach. I certainly always loved athletics, and I'd like to think I gave everything I had into them. And I'd like to think that I followed direction and I showed up every day and I I gave max effort. So I think that's ultimately what catapulted me into coaching. I think somebody else saw it in me, and then they asked me to do it. And once I started doing it, I, I absolutely fell in love with it. So. I'm originally from the northern part of New Jersey. I went to Mawa High School where I played football and basketball. I then went on to Utica College, which is a um, small private school in New York State. It's a Division III school. It's in the Empire Eight. And um, I played football for four slash five years there because of a medical redshirt my senior year. Um, I had a business degree. Upon graduation, I went back home and had a sales job. And then I got called to be a GA. I don't know if any of the viewers know what a GA is, but that's where, you know, Saban, Sweeney, Urban Meyer, all the greats, they started as being a GA. I had no idea what it was. So when I got asked to be one, uh, my head coach at the time, who's still my head coach, Blaze Fagiano, he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll pay for your master's, we'll put a roof over your head, you'll get a little money, and you'll coach for your alma mater. And uh, I got in the car, and I – drove up. So I was, a, I was a GA for two years, coaching the wideouts. My offensive coordinator, Jim Kramer, got a head coaching job elsewhere. And then I became the uh, the quarterback's coach and the offensive coordinator. I've been serving that role for three years. Truly do what I love at a place that I love. So what did you learn the most for that first year as the GA? Well, what did you learn as a GA that you're happy you did it this way? Man, so that, that first year being a GA, so try to try to put yourself in my shoes. You're, you're at your college that you played at, so you still have previous relationships. And now you're being asked to serve on a, on a greater role, a, a leadership role. Not only a leadership role where, you know, people are looking at you and you have to make decisions, but, you know, our, our school is like a first-generation school. A lot of kids, including myself, they're probably the first ones in their family to get a college degree. So, you know, and at the division three level, you have to wear a lot of hats. You're not just playing in practice and calling plays, you know, you're serving as an academic advisor. You're going through their degree evaluation and uh, telling them what to sign up for. You got to be a sports psychologist sometimes because you got to get to know them inside and out. So you know how to coach them and know what makes them tick and, know when they're upset and why they're upset and what's going on at home and all those other different things. But, um, I mean, the, th- the thing that I learned the most in my first year was um, to be open-minded and to work hard, which is cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. You can't hear that enough. I remember having many a sleepless night in the, in the football office doing simple tasks of, you know, breaking down film or labeling film. Um, running term in our office, I used to make fun of it, but I kind of live by it now. Um, you guys know me who are in my, my inner circle here, but it was called Figure It Out. <laughs> so <laughs> when you were given a task in the Utica College football office and uh, you wanted to know every little itty bitty detail on it so you could do your best job possible on it, whoever assigned you to do that task, they gave it to you for a reason. And they want it completed when they said to have it completed by. So if you ask too many questions, you're just prolonging the process. You just got to figure it out, and it's trial by error, and you're thrown into the fire, and you learn whatever you put your name on, your name's on it for forever. So if you really messed up on it, 
although you wanted to do well and although you asked questions to try to figure out how to do it better, if you didn't do it well, you're not going to get asked to do another task. But uh, if you do do it well, you know, you gain some trust and earn some respect and you'll get asked to do another one. My, my second year being the GA, we, um, we started using a different um, internet process. Um, it was called Huddle, which is like very commonly known in high school athletics and college athletics. ROC at the time wasn't very savvy with the technology. And I was asked as a 23-year-old second-year coach to write the whole playbook. So, you know, that was a task that I, I took a lot of pride in. Yeah. You know, you learn really quick, you're like, hey, coach, how do you want this drawn? How do you want me to word this? How do you want me to do this? And it's just, hey, I gave this to you to do, do it. Don't ask me every step of every question along the way. So, now, yeah, I mean, put your name on things and, and do it. Don't be afraid to mess up. Now, have you – now, was there values that you took from that offensive coordinator into what you do today, or have you kind of modified it to be your own or somewhere in between? Oh, my God. Um, the world of coaching and athletics – and, and the, it's a very competitive profession. So a lot of people want to think that, you know, they're the best at doing something or, you know, they're the only one doing something and they constantly want to beat their chest, which, you know, nobody, nobody shows up to lose, certainly. But I think people who are open-minded and keep themselves humble, no matter what level of success or what level of um, the opposite of success is that they've had, you know, they stay the course and they ask questions and they try to get better. So, I mean, just being open-minded to, to answer your question, really, like, what did I take and how did I make it my own? You have to make it your own because you have to be yourself, you know, and, and kids are smart. Like, they'll see right through you if, I'm not saying not to read an article or watch a video and get something out of it, but yeah. if you can't get that something and apply it, right, like absorb what, what, what applies, there's a lot of good information out there. If you can't make it your own information or put your own spin on it, people are going to see through that and you're not going to be able to do it consistently. But uh, my, my OC before me, Jim Cramer, he was just a great man. I think you got to be a good person first and foremost before you're good at anything that you do. So, I mean, I, I think he was very organized and he, um, he was very disciplined and he was able to keep our, our team in check. And he was very good at dealing with multiple personalities. You no, know, the kid from Northern Jersey who had two parents or the kid from the, from PA who grew up on a farm or the kid from Connecticut who had no parents. Like he was good at getting all those personalities to mesh and, you know, keeping his rules simple and having them follow them and then holding them accountable to it. The OC for him, not to cut you off that I, I played on that, he was, he was a good X's and O's guy. Like he can get on the whiteboard and, and do his thing and, and talk about concepts in, in detail. So, I mean, you've, you can't just be a good guy and not be good at your job. You know, so you got to have the little bit of the balance of both. And I think they both had, had a good balance of that. And I was very fortunate to learn under, under both of them. We're now head coaches in the profession. So, you know, I can only hope to do that someday. Yeah. I mean, um, um, thankfully you said that. So what is your goals? What is the end goal? Not end goal necessarily, but what is the progression of you? Where do you want to be next? Where, where, where do you want to be? Right where I'm at right now, man. <laughs> I think you gotta live it. I think you gotta live in the moment. I've been fortunate to work at a place that um believes in like professional development. So I've had the opportunity to speak at clinics, I've had the opportunity to go to clinics, work camps at different campuses of all different divisions, whether it's one, one double A, two or three. Um, it's, it's being, it's learning how to be a learner. You got to learn how to learn and you got to keep yourself humble to know that you can learn throughout the duration of your career, whatever that career is. Where do I want to be? I, I speaking of those clinics, I went to one clinic and I'm forgetting the coach's name right now, but I'll never forget his face and his message. He said, um, make it where you're at. He said, make it where you're at. And that always resonated with me. And to this point, I chose to go to a school. I stayed there, you know, for the duration of getting my degree. Every day wasn't easy. I didn't play as much as I wanted to. There was always somebody I had to compete with. There was always things that I had to do that I didn't necessarily know were good for me at the moment. 
but I'm glad I did them because they were. I got my degree from a place, I GA'd at a place, and I OC'd at a place. So I, I've seen the same place in three different levels. Mm -hmm. So th this guy who, who said at that clinic that one day, make it where you're at, I think that resonates because, I mean, in our profession in coaching, it's always a pet peeve of mine when you see the guy who's not giving everything he has to the current moment. Like, never be too good for something or some place. You know, when you're constantly looking three steps ahead, you, you fall over the twig or the stick in front of you. So, you know, live in the moment, be where you're at. That's not to say that I don't have big aspirations to be anywhere, but why I coach is to positively influence people around me. And I, I have that avenue right now. I'm on that stage and I can do that. So right now I've got the best job in the world. And if I continue to give everything I have into it, we'll see, we'll see where the chips fall. What, uh, what right now has been your favorite part of coaching? Right now where you're at as an offensive coordinator, what is your favorite part of what you're doing? The, the, the Division three level is awesome. Because like I said, I, I kind of have to be a uh, – I've got to be an academic advisor. I've got to be a guidance counselor. I also have to have some level of expertise to, you know, call plays and plan practices. I've got to – be a strength and conditioning coach. I got to be in the weight room. So I, I like the multiplicity of the job. I like that it changes season to season, although you're always competing and you're always working with the same people. You know, my job in the fall is to win football games. And then my job in the off season is to develop the talent that we have, get myself better and recruit. So like recruiting is I could spend an hour talking on recruiting itself I can spend the whole day just going through my emails, my Twitter DMs, and not look at our playbook once. Yeah. Um, but the, the best part about my job is the, the relationship building. I've been doing it for five years now, so I've actually seen the cycle of somebody that's been recruited into our program as a freshman leave as a college graduate and as a senior and be in the workforce. So there's literally a kid today that I was talking to um, – he was from Hackensack High School, you know, a little pride there being a Jersey guy myself. He, um, he played for us as a freshman. He was in good academic standing. He was a great kid. His teammates loved him. The coaches loved him. He transferred back home to Rutgers to be closer to his family and to save a little money. And he actually walked onto the football team and made the team and, and played, played in football games. Has pictures of him playing against Penn State in a Rutgers uniform. And he's graduating, virtually graduating this May. That's and awesome. he literally just reached out to me today. I was like, thank you so much. Like, I'm not going to forget the things that, you know, the interactions that we had four or five years ago. So, you know, even just a relationship like that at a shallow level, I've only gotten to know and interact with that person for a couple months. But, you know, you never know what you're going to say or who you're going to influence in the moment. So, you know, you always got to be on. So those relationships, that's the best part about, about my job is that it's a people's business and like learning about what makes people tick, you know, where they want to be in them and their lives and like helping them get there. Yeah. That's, that, that sounds, that sounds like an awesome thing to see them in the recruiting process, see them through all their years at the school and then see them do whatever at the end, wherever they're going, wherever they're going in the, you know, the workforce or whatever the next step is, it's gotta be a, a really cool process, but touch a little bit more on the beginning of that process with the recruiting. What, What's the most fun about that? What's the least fun about that? Just talk a little bit about recruiting and Okay. The world's getting smaller now, Nikki. Like it's like <laughs> technology's a great thing if you use it the right way. Yep. So, you know, I could talk to a kid from Michigan because of a direct message on Twitter, you know, and hop on a FaceTime with him and he can get to know me and I can get to know him. But um the funnest part about recruiting is getting a new area and like mapping out the area. So like we'll physically go into schools for a month. You've kind of seen me go through that, knowing me personally. And um, how far is this high school from this high school? You know, and if, if can I fit this high school in who's got this kid? And then um, find out the pizzeria or the deli in the area to have lunch and then find out about like the culture of the area and what coaches know who and who's the point of contact in the building and how to navigate the hallways. Just the, the whole logistics part of it is fun to kind of figure out and play the game and do it in an efficient manner. Um, and then getting to know the kids and seeing the families. So, again, that whole process begins with 
watching them virtually, like on film, thinking that there are a certain caliber athletes where you want to go and talk to them, making the initial contact with them in their high school, talking to their coach about them, and then getting them to your campus where they bring their mom, their dad, their, their siblings, whatever. You know, you go and see them in their environment, and then they come and see you in your environment. And then again, fast forward, seeing them the following August, giving them a helmet and watching them, you know, adapt to the culture of your program, whatever that might be. So that's just the funnest part about it. Again, it's like the relationship building, but I, I like the hunt of it too. Like the, the evaluating of the prospect and then finding the prospect and then finding out how you're going to efficiently, you know, plan your day to maximize the amount of people you can talk to to help your program. Yeah. And so for, to break down the process a little bit, you're, you don't have, the ability to see them during their actual games on visits. You're visiting them when they're practicing more in the spring, right? Or do you so, have that? Oh, that's, so that's a, that's a good question, Nick. So for us in the spring, when we get out of spring ball, like May, June, July, obviously now with coronavirus, none of that's happening. But this is normally the time where I would physically go into a high school and I would pull a junior, like a class of 2021 kid out of class and talk to him about our school. Gotcha. Over the summer, I then work a bunch of camps, you know, all over the Northeast. And then luckily, I've been doing it long enough to where I'm not just evaluating at the camps and just writing on a note sheet that I get, but I'm coaching. Mm -hmm. So I'm working a station or a drill. So that, that's the, the best way to recruit a kid to where he's physically getting coached by me he can see what my temperament is, what my attitude is, how I coach, the buzzwords I use, the techniques that we're drilling. He can see if, hey, am I going to want to spend four years with this dude? And then you fast forward, I do not get to see them during their season because we're playing our season. Mm. And then, you know, it's all, you're right, it's all in that summer phase. And I'm never going to see them in a live competition for their high school, unless they're a local kid. And obviously, we're stationed in central New York. So, we'll go to some of the local high schools on a bye week and watch some of those games. I do like going to the basketball games while I'm recruiting though. So I do like watching them in basketball or wrestling or whatever other sport that they're doing while I'm on the road recruiting them. That was going to be my next question. Have you ever used that technique where you use the second sport they play or whether it's baseball, whether it's basketball, whether it's whatever they're playing, have you ever used that? But Absolutely. And, and we love the multi-sport athlete. You know, it, it's funny, the world's cyclical, it goes in trends. There is that phase of specialization. You know, let me play the same sport for three seasons and let me go on these travel teams. And now it's coming back to where it's popular to be a multi-sport athlete. There's a lot of good positive media out there about that. And I fully agree with it just because the, the more sports you play, the more movement you get to learn. And I, Honestly, the more people that you get to influence and the more people that you'll make a relationship with that will have your back. You know, you'll have the, the football staff, the basketball staff, and the lacrosse staff, all those coaches, even though there may be some overlap there, your football coach might be your lax coach, but some of the assistants, you're going to have multiple people who know who you are and can vouch for your work ethic. And you just make yourself more marketable that way. And I mean, also, you you just you know, started talking about it, but with the whole thing going on with the coronavirus right now, how has that affected you? How has it affected college athletics in general? What have you, what is the process for going into the summer to next year? Is it uncertain? Talk about that. Oh my God. Well, everything's uncertain right now. It, it just is. I'm optimistic. I'd like to think that we all have an athletic season in the fall in some type of way, shape or form. But how has it impacted us? I have not been in my office since March 16th. You can tell I've been counting the days. And we, we <laughs> tend to spend a lot of time in that office. Um, we've sent all of our kids home. That's been a, uh, a learning curve for them to learn how to be a student in a virtual environment. Some kids, you know, they have Wi-Fi. They don't have Wi-Fi. They have the Microsoft offices. They got to use their little sister's laptop whatever it is, you know, some of the kids that we have on our team, the most comfortable bed they've ever slept in has been in the one in their dorm room in the freshman hall. So like, that's why it's important to build those relationships and know about the kids and where they come from. But we've sent all of our kids home. I've been home. 
Um, I have my work laptop that I'm on now. We've got HDMI hookups to the TVs in my house. We went out and bought some whiteboards for the house. Um, you can use this as an excuse or you can use this as a way to get better. So I know that there's certainly some things that our staff and our players have gotten out of this that have helped us be better. Now, I'd like to think that there's going to be no acclimation period for us once we return in August or whenever. We're going to be in good shape. We're going to be ready to go. So, I mean, personally for me, like digitalizing our playbook and, you know, recording myself doing installs or the meetings that we've been having or finding a simpler way and boiling something down to its simplest form to be able to describe it to a freshman, incoming freshman who has no idea what our offense is, boiling it down into its simplest form and giving it to them in a digital format for them to have some type of understanding of what we're trying to do before they ever even meet me in person or put the helmet on on August 11th is our report day. So, you know, just simplifying our process and, and making it more readily available, sharing it with them through Huddle and through Excel, PowerPoint, Word, and email and video with Zooms and Google Hangouts and such. Now, do you feel, obviously, when this is over, do you think this will make you stronger as a coach in the fact that you have different tools to get to these kids now, whether it's doing things electronically, whether it's doing things through Zoom, through any other process you've learned over the last two months, do you think you've become a stronger coach because of this? No, no doubt. And you know what? I, I don't mean to say that and dilute the power of an in-person, physical, face-to-face -face conversation because I think that is still the best form and way to do it. But again, you can make an excuse or you can get better. So you and I right now, like me looking you in your eyes, talking to you, I feel like we're in the same room. So like with technology nowadays, like if you can get your passion and your personality through the screen, you should be able to replicate an in-person conversation or interaction through this. I do think it will get us better and not just because of the virtual technologies, but because of the self-discipline that you need to have during this time. So I'm trying to tell all of our kids, our whole staff is like, hey, stay in a routine. This time is more important now than ever because you don't have people watching you and there's still things that you have to accomplish and nobody's gonna know whether you put the work in or not until, I mean, obviously fast forward, when we see you again, we'll know if you were working or not. But right now, if you were to text me like, Hey coach, I did this, 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 and this. I know what I'm doing. I'd have no way to, to know that you did or didn't. A lot of my kids will send me videos, not because I ask, but because they want me to know that they're working and they're looking for some feedback. So, I, I mean, running saying in, in our office, we tell our kids, hey, set your alarm. Like, go up and get after something. Like, don't just sleep until one o'clock or wait to get your workout in and your homework done. Like, wake up and get right to it. Stay in a routine hold yourself accountable to stay in a schedule because if you can't listen to yourself or tell yourself to do something and actually do it, why would other people follow you or trust you? So yeah. I think it's just like that the self-discipline is going to be the, the, the best and the biggest thing that we get out of this. That's awesome. And obviously like working on yourself too, Nikki, you know, like I know a lot of our staff has used this time to get better connected with their families because they don't get to spend as much time with their families as maybe they want or, you know, even us and our friend group at home, our guys from high school and college and things like those people you haven't had an opportunity to talk with over the years because you're busy, quote unquote, like we all have time now. Now you can use it to invest into other people and yourself and things. Catch up on the readings that you want to do. Start the podcast that you were always passionate about. <laughs> you know, you've got time for these things now. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's been something that at first, you know, when this all started, um, you know, me being in the food service industry as a bartender, it was a weird feeling because you didn't know when you were going back, especially in that field. You didn't know when it was happening. So I had to take the time to to put my mind towards something that was going to benefit my future, hopefully. So this has been an awesome thing. Um, but to touch back real quick, you were talking about, you know, the season starting up and everything like that. What this coming year, what are your goals? What what are the goals for team? What are the goals for yourself? Uh, touch on that a little bit. You got it. Um, the, the goal is always the same. And we don't like talking about it. I don't like talking about the W word. 
I like talking about the things that we have to do to obtain the things that we want. Um, I want our guys disciplined. I want our guys knowing what they have to do. And I want our guys to die empty, we talk about. Like they, they give everything that they have physically, mentally, spiritually. Like know what you're doing, be disciplined in doing it, and do it until you can't. <laughs> and we try to teach in terms of threes. And we want to do that as many times as we possibly can. Stay focused on the task at hand. I know that our report day is August 11th. I know that we got a blue-orange scrimmage, an inter-squad scrimmage seven days after that. We then scrimmage Wilkes University at our place. Then we open up on a Friday night at St. Lawrence, which is a Liberty League opponent. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we want to be as successful as we possibly can be. We want to play in the postseason. We, um, we have a young program. We've only had football for 19 years. We're going on 20 this year in the year of 2020 in the year of Corona here. And, uh, we expect to be bigger and, and better than ever and try harder than we ever have. So, and believe in one another. Yeah. yeah the goal yeah, is yeah. always going to be the same. Yeah. That's, uh, because you guys had a very successful year last year, right? We've, we've, as a, as a program, three out of the last five years been to a postseason game. We still have not won our conference championship yet. And our conference is one of the most competitive in all of division three. So, Whoever wins our conference will normally win at multiple playoff games and have a chance at a national championship. We like playing the, the, the width and the breadth of competition that we have. We love having to bring it every single week. You know, that, that ultimately prepares you. Absolutely. So one of the things I want to do in these interviews as we, as we near towards the end was I wanted to start asking some questions to the guests. So my question for you is, if you had to take yourself as a coach or as a player, whatever way you want to go, because you have done both, and put yourself in one locker room in time, in a football locker room, uh, whatever team, whenever, whatever group of guys you want to be around, where would you place yourself? Just to, just to be a fly on the wall. That's a good one, man. You know, you know I'm not as good as you, nearly as good as you with the professional sports and things, because I'm so locked in on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky to be, to be in some really good locker rooms as a player and as a coach. But um, when you look back in history, uh, I'm not going to be able to quote the year, but like that national championship Florida team with like, like the Florida Gators University of Florida, like Tim Tebow and Chris Leak and like mm -hmm. Percy Harvin. And yeah. I think Aaron Hernandez is on that team. Yep. Like th think about the amount of personalities and, and at that place was Urban Meyer yeah, the coach yeah. then? Urban Meyer was the coach. I think that was two thousand. Oh my god! Could, could you? Yeah. Uh, you know, and Urban Meyer has got one of the most influential books in the coaching profession. You know, above the line. I, have you ever read that? No. That that'd be one that you'd like to to read. I know a lot of the coaches on our staff have, and he's talked about some of his previous experiences. But imagine being in that locker room, the Tebow speech. You're like you've got some really influential people in there, and uh, you know, um, how about you? Me being a Jersey guy and a Giants fan, how about like one of them nine and seven Giants teams that took the Patriots to the ringer in, in the regular season finale and then go on to win it, you know, win three, four road games and then win the Super Bowl with personalities like Justin Tuck and Tom Coughlin. And I think those would be some really interesting teams to, to be a part of off the top of my head. And I'm sure there's a lot more out there, but those, those two. Yeah, I think those teams that you touched on, the teams that had a little more uh, fight in them, so the 9-7 and seven teams, the 8-8, eight and eight, the 10-6 and six teams that got through a playoff and, and be the part of that journey because you know there was some, whether it was coaching or players, there was some big-time leaders in that room. And there had to be for a team to advance through a set of playoffs that way, being a 9-7 and seven team and having all this turmoil throughout the season. And I think that would be the way I would want to see. I mean, no I'm, all over, I'm all over sports wise. I like baseball. I like football. So I don't yeah. even know where I would start, but it's definitely the turmoil is always fun. By the way, I'm looking at this roster from that Florida team you're talking about. And Percy Harvin, Joe Hayden, Tim Tebow, Aaron Hernandez, um, Will Hill. Do you remember Will Hill from Jersey? The Thrill, the thrill baby. The Thrill. Will, the Thrill Hill from West Orange. He was at St. Peter's. Riley Cooper. Uh, they had a red-shirted Cam Newton who lasted there for wow. a year. Wow. Uh, Look at that. You know, being in that room, why did he transfer? Like, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, there's definitely some personalities in there. And how about, I mean, the most inspirational or like influential team, like I, I can remember being uh, on a treadmill in the morning at like 6 a.m. before the workday started and watching ESPN and watching the story about um, like the Golden State Warriors breaking the regular season win, win record. You know, how did they recruit the level of talent that they did? How, you know, and they've got some underdogs there. Nobody wanted to draft Steph or, or Clay or Draymond. They recruit KD there. How did they deal with being the villains? How did they deal with the level of success that they had? You know, they, do they fire Mark Jackson or they don't renew him? They fired him. Yeah. And then they bring in Steve Kerr, who's a first-year head coach. Like, all the storylines there as well. And there was so much that led up to it. If you if you look into that, it was that they had multiple times tried to trade Steph and Clay for bigger superstars, and it just never worked out the way they wanted it. I mean, let me rephrase that. It worked out. It worked out, but it didn't work out the way they had this vision for, and they're probably thankful every day for not doing that. So you just got to imagine in that case, not necessarily – I mean, yes, the locker room. You're talking about those players, but the room where the coaches were, the rooms – upper on the front office like what decisions they had to make what it, it, it's just those type of franchises would be a blast to be on the fly on the wall for their drafts for their free agency their everything every pro, every part of the process without a doubt because I mean you, you get the teams that got to fight for things and then like anytime you have that level of success people want to know how you did it mm -hmm. and, you know it's funny if you're bad, people think you stink. If you're too good, people don't like you because they want to see change. Everybody wants you to be average. So, like, you know, it's almost as hard sometimes being being at that level of success. Like, how do they sustain that success for as long as they did? Yeah. So, I mean, I like to see them. And then, you know, obviously with the last dance going on, it's cool to see that inside that locker room. And, you know, Phil, <laughs> Phil Jackson was uh, – I'm not caught up with the episodes. I've seen, like, half of every single one of them. But uh, – okay. They're on late for me. I try yeah. to get to uh, Phil Jackson was, was regarded as a hippie. Dennis Rodman's got three different hairstyles. He's going to Vegas. Jordan's cutthroat gambling dude who's the best at what he does. Pippin Shy. All them all those guys, you know, the roles that they accepted and how they worked with one another. It's it's all about building those relationships and getting them to work together. So any of those teams would be fascinating to be around. Yeah, and I think as we touched on that Florida team, so I'm going to use them as an example again. But when you break down football, I think football amongst any other sport is so much more onus on the coaching staff to me because you're real, especially at that level, college level, because you're focusing on the, you know, the one-on-one -on -one player conversations, you know, between the players, between the coaches, then you're worried about getting them ready for on-field play. So I can imagine that coaching staff at Florida with Urban Meyer, with all those characters on that team, having to keep them in check mentally and then get them ready to play. I can imagine just how tough that was. Without a doubt. And like you said, especially at the, the college level, there's so many other things that are going on besides football and like football teams, the roster just by nature is it's, it's a bigger roster. So you're dealing with more personalities. It's, it's harder to get everyone to beat to the same drum when there's more people, right? Like you're really relaying a message and it could turn into a bad game of telephone from your first string telling your fifth string, from your offensive player telling your defensive player to your special teams guy, to your strength coach, to your this, your that. You really got to have your stuff in line. You really got to be organized, disciplined, and consistent every single day. And you got to motivate young people to want to be great. And, you know, you got to motivate them to do things that maybe aren't the best for them but it is for the team so you know I, I would love to be in that QB room with with Chris Leak, Tim Tebow and Cam Newton I, I don't know if I'm paraphrasing there and I don't know if all three of them were in the same no, room I think, I, I, I think maybe now that I'm thinking about it Cam may not have been with Leak, but they both were definitely with Tebow at one point so in some way or another they all were intertwined there and then you talk about Urban Meyer and I mean not even looking, I can imagine behind Urban Meyer, the coaching staff he had has to have a ton of coaches who have went on to to coach other programs and have their own right. program. I can only imagine because of knowing his coaching tree. Um, and that's the biggest thing. You know, you look at some of these teams and you have guys like Meyer, Nick Saban, and um, 
the other one that has a big coaching tree that I can't think right now. I'm going to say the obvious of like a Dabo Sweeney. Is that okay, where you're going? Yeah. Or? yeah. Okay. I, yeah well, I think his, his coaching tree is newer in a way where. Yeah. Now, nah, obviously, he, you know, he's a little bit more recent than, yeah. you know, a guy that I love here and talk is uh, PJ Fleck. Minnesota. Minnesota mm -hmm. You know, and I, I've had the opportunity. I was fortunate enough to hear him talk in person at a coaching convention. I heard Matt rule this past year. Okay. Can't you know, remember. just these, these celebrities these giants in the coaching profession, yeah. you know, what, what makes them tick? Why are their teams successful? Yeah. I, I mean, I have this like fascination with coaches at the college level because you have to have a personality you have to have, and everybody's different. Every coach has a different set of personality, different set of skills. And some of them are just, I like watching them. I like, you could tell you have a good feel as a fan for their game plan. You have a good feel for the preparation they've put in, whether it is PJ Fleck who, I love, I love um, James Franklin out in Penn State. I think he's yep. a fun guy to watch. You could tell the players like him, at least from afar. You know, you feel it. Um, but a lot of these coaches, you just, you just feel it. And I love, uh, of course, I'm going to forget his name down. He won the national championship at LSU. Last uh, name. Coach O. Coach O. Let's we'll go back. Coach O. That works. Um, he's hey, head over Duran. Hold that tiger. Yeah, he's a blast. So, it's it's fun to watch these. And you, these hey, and before you get off of him, you can just tell he's a genuine guy, right? Yes. Like the first time he went viral, <laughs> the poor guy's <laughs> trying to have a, a press conference, right? And, and two of his players are practicing behind him. They're just throwing the ball around. They're being a little loud. He politely goes to tell them, hey, you know, quiet down a little bit, comes back, then has to go back. His tone changes a little bit. But the, the most impressive part of that whole bit was that he was able to seamlessly go between you know. being an inter interviewee to being a coach to being back to an interviewee to being a coach because, again, he's his own guy. He's just being himself, which is the you know easiest way to go about it, the yeah. only way to go about it. And what I love for him is that he's found somewhere that he's comfortable, and so he loves Louisiana. And you could just, you could just tell he loves Louisiana, and he fits there, and he, he's just – he slides right in as the face of that team. and. You know, he's had all these opportunities that I think he was at USC as an interim head coach. Um, he's been offense. I mean, he's been coordinators all over. Um, so for him to finally fit is a good thing to see because he is a great guy. You could just tell he's a great guy and he deserves it. Um, no doubt. And what's awesome is um, you got to be adaptable. And at some point, you, you can't care what people are going to think about you. Because LSU is this SEC school. LSU is this power run team. And all of a sudden, they got Joe Burrow throwing however many touchdowns he did, 64 to seven interceptions. I'm completely fabricating numbers here probably, but I'm sure it was something astronomical yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, they got these two wideouts who are going to go be first-round picks, Jefferson and the other guy. Again, I'm not good with my, my pro names and my big names, but yeah. they're throwing the ball over the yard and they're able to win. You know, like Pat Mahomes is able to have 42 pass attempts in the Super Bowl and, and play. You've got these guys – Lamar Jackson, uh, uh, Pat Mahomes, uh, Russell Wilson, uh, Baker Mayfield. Who's the kid in the Cardinals? Uh, Kyler Murray. All these quarterbacks that wouldn't have been drafted 10 years ago because you'd rather go with the 6'5", under center pro style guy like Ryan Mallett. Like, all these guys are finding a home now because at the end of the day, they're coachable and they make plays. They, they have the results that show it. So you, you got to be able to adapt, which I think the NFL, the NCAA has. And now – I'm sure six years from now, every team will have a fullback and we'll be back to running ISO and waggle and things like that. Now, got to keep up the trash. With you bringing that up, real quick, I actually just brought up a point. Do you, obviously, as a coach, you 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 look at other programs are doing well and you try to adapt in a in a little way. But is there any like for you if you see a team that all of a sudden starts throwing the ball over the yard and it's working? Does that make you feel like you have to adapt a certain way or do you still stay to who you are? You absorb what applies. I think that's like a Bruce Lee quote. I don't know who quoted that. I think it's a Bruce Lee quote, quote and I'm probably paraphrasing it, but you absorb what applies. So I still personally, I just love football. I love my job. So I love, I love triple option football. I love true spread air raid Mike Leach football. I think there's a place for both of them. Right, like Minnesota and, and Washington State and Texas Tech and they, like all these different teams, 
Memphis this year, they can have success in a bunch of different ways. So for me, I like learning about what's out there and then saying, hey, what do we have? What works with what is out there? Can I learn it to the point where I can teach it? Can I teach it and can we rep it enough to where we can perfect it and actually do it in a live setting when bullets are flying? So for me, I, our saying is do what it takes. <laughs> we're going to do what it takes. If we got to throw it 40 times or run it 40 times, we're going to be willing to do whatever it takes. So um, my first year being an OC, I knew our system. As a young coach, I knew our system. And I knew it in and out. I knew it as a player. I knew it in and out. I could play multiple positions. I could play special teams. I knew our offense. But there's more ways of doing it. There's a thousand ways to skin a cat out there. And the end, and the end result is to gain yards and score points. And so finding, finding all the ways that you can do that and then taking the one that applies to what you're, you have. So for us, depending on, you know, what, what returning personnel we have that year, who's on our coaching staff, who we're playing that week, how much time we have to prepare for them. Those are all things that will come into, you know, affect that week and decide what we're going to do. Because you might have this play that's going to work. And guess what? If your kids don't get it or you can't teach it or you don't have the time to rep it, it's not what you know, it's what your kids can do. So I like knowing what's out there and then picking the stuff that's going to work for what we have. Absolutely. Well, I have to say, this is this has been a blast. We're definitely going to do this again, for sure. As we get maybe closer to the season and things change, we'll definitely have this conversation again. Um, as always, thank you, Joe. I, I, I had a great time today. Hey, not a problem, man. Um, anytime I get to spend with you is great. This podcast has been awesome. If the, if the listeners, the viewers, if they haven't heard any of the previous ones, you got to hop on. You got to come out and watch this thing. Support my guy, Nick Barlotta. He's going to be doing some great things here. Nikki, whatever I could do to help you out, and I would love to be, it would be my absolute honor and a privilege for me to be back on here. Thank you, man. Um, fear the moose for all the viewers and the listeners out there. <laughs> Have a great weekend, guys. <laughs>